Matthew 4, 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they'll lift you up in their hands so that you'll not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to share a personal confession or secret. Uh, I have suffered many years as a supporter of the New South Wales Blues. Hands up. I've suffered even more years as a supporter of Parramatta, but Dave, we'll talk about that later on, won't we? Uh, I'm not passionate overly about rugby league, uh, but state of origin hurts every year. Uh, as each year rolls by, uh, that maroon bandwagon just seems to line me up and drive straight over the top of me. It's inevitable. Uh, more certain every year, and I just seem to grow further and further away from that trophy. Uh, I looked up the statistics this week. Uh, after 37 series, Queensland have won 21, and New South Wales, 13. And uh, the next seemed a long way away at the start of 2018. Uh, and then they announced Brad Fittler as coach. It didn't fill me with much confidence. Uh, I struggle to understand what Mr Fittler says as a commentator as he mangles syllables and words. How is he going to get a group of elite sportsmen together, create a coherent plan and instill a mentality of winning? I didn't have much hope. As I read the media reports leading up to the game, my hope dropped even more. No phones in camp, walking in bare feet on grass to feel the energy. Social events at soup kitchens. It was a good PR campaign, but to me, it didn't sound like it was going to stop the Maroon bandwagon. Announced, revealed, and then the testing came. And hallelujah, we got it. Two, one. We won. Yeah, you know, my hopes weren't high. But as that trophy came back over the tweed, I thought, this man's a mad genius. He's been announced, he's been revealed, he's been tested, he's a genius. Now it happens in many fields, doesn't it? We're about to face a year of a New South Wales and a federal election. We'll be presented with heroes who'll be announced and revealed, policies that will be a solution. In wartime it happens, on sporting field it happens, there's an announcement, there's a revelation, but the key is what? The key is the testing, isn't it? The key is the testing, because then we see if the person's made of the right stuff. Listen to this again. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's a title that grabbed many of the people of the day. Jews, subjugated, oppressed, dreaming of a future that seemed impossible. And Matthew says, here is the bloke. Let me announce him to you. He's the saviour of the universe. He's the son of your greatest king. He's descended from the patriarch. He's the hero you've wanted. The family tree backs it up. He's made of the right stuff. And then the revelations continue as you looked at these passages in the lead up to Christmas. Matthew 1 to 3. Let me skip through them. Six times this man fulfills the promise of God, Matthew wants us to know. He's described, Matthew 1.21, as the bloke who'll deal with our sins. That's what Matthew recounts. 
Kings from the Far East and those who are corrupt uh, tremble in front of him. Matthew paints a picture of the life of this man as he flees as a child into Egypt and come back is, is shown to be the life of the nation in small, Matthew wants to remind us. And then any good hero needs a prophet, don't they? And then this wild and woolly figure appears in the desert, John the Baptist, socially unacceptable, announcing a message that confronts and Matthew wants us to know. We've had an announcement. We've had a revelation. Is he actually made of the right stuff? Can we test him and see what happens? Well, we're going to see that today. Let me pray and then we're going to dive into the testing of Jesus. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can open it, read it by your spirit. Help us to understand it and apply. In Jesus' name, amen. All these hopes come together, these raised expectations for the people of God, these dreams that might succeed. All these hopes start to come together in the baptism of Jesus. If you've got your Bibles open, uh, chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptised by John. John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptised by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfil all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptised, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. It's an unusual moment, isn't it? The baptism of Jesus fills me with confidence that the first baptism interview didn't go so well. But then as Jesus rises out of the water, a voice calls out. It's a significant voice, isn't it, when God speaks? And God says, ladies and gentlemen, this is my boy. This is my boy in whom I delight. You know, God's actually quoting the Old Testament. That's why the reading from Drinda was so significant. Psalm 2 is the coronation psalm that's read every time a king is installed because the king is from the line of David and thought to be the son of God or at least in that line of descent. And here we actually we don't have a psalmist or a poet reading it out. We have God himself quoting the coronation psalm. Pay attention. This is my boy. Well, surely your hopes are pretty high at this point, aren't they? You're blowing the dust off the promises. You're ignoring the cracks. He's been announced. He's been revealed. Has he been tested? Has he been tested? Well, look at verse 1 of chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Uh, my first 40-hour famine, I lasted till morning tea time and mum brought out the mint slices. It was all over. Uh, so 40 days and 40 nights, just wow. But it's a really strange scenario in those first two verses, isn't it? It's one that if you, we don't handle carefully, will actually sit uncomfortably with us, perhaps even cause some problems. The Holy Spirit leading the Son of God into temptation How often do you hear that in the Bible? How often do you hear that in our language? We need to be careful here, don't we? And uh, the care we need to have is around that little word, tempt. Uh, Right throughout the New Testament, it's actually the same word as the word test. It doesn't change. Uh, What changes the way it's handled is who's doing it. You see, from God's side, an event is a test. From the devil's side, the very same event is an opportunity for temptation. From God's side, it's a moment to prove what he's already planned. From the devil's side, it's a moment to put out a banana peel for the plans of God. And God has chosen this moment to have his boy go into the desert so he can be proven and the devil rubs his hands and goes, you little ripper, I've been here before. You see, he has been here before, hasn't he? Now, the original readers would have picked up some of the images there, wouldn't they? Oh, every time the wilderness is mentioned and you're a Jew, what do you remember? Well, it was a period of wandering, wasn't there? Every time you see the numbers 40, what do you, you remember the same period, don't you? 
That wasn't 40 days, it was 40 years. And every time you think of hunger, you remember that time, don't you? When God's people cried out and complained and said, gee, that stew in Egypt was much better. Matthew's already joined the dots for us, hasn't he? Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. He's actually made the connection for us and said, well, this bloke is the people of God in one person. He said all the hopes are starting to be raised because perhaps, perhaps what they didn't do, this man can do. What they didn't do, perhaps this man can do. Perhaps when tested, he'll be everything we weren't. It's worth pausing there and having a think about the job for God's people, isn't it? Uh, just a little side tangent. God's people aren't really that special, I hate to tell you. Are they whingers and complainers? Are they need to see the cosmic chiropractor because they've got stiff necks. They're people who always point back at what they could have had and not what God's providing. They're rebellious and hard-hearted. They are not special. They're God's people. They're special because God chose them. Because he made a promise and he doesn't forget his promises. Remember that from last week? They're special because of his consistent method. You're a rebellious, stiff-necked, hard-hearted, contrary, whinging mob of people. You're mine. And he saves them, doesn't he? Remembers his promises, uh, Exodus 2. Pulls them out and demonstrates his power over the whole known universe. And as he pulls them out, as he saves them, he constitutes them. He makes them his people. Did you notice that about the Ten Commandments? They come after the saving. Not so they're saved. And at the heart of them as a people are these words we heard from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. They did well with that, didn't they? That's what it means to be the people of God. That you have one God and every fibre of your heart, soul and strength is devoted to him because he has saved you. Get the order? And in fact, your job is very clear. Exodus 9 and 1 to 8, you are to represent me to the world. That's why the Ten Commandments are there. Not a checklist on the fridge, but a statement of the character of God that you represent to the world. Heart, soul and strength. They did well, didn't they? Well, as we come to the testing of Jesus, all that's lurking in our minds. Can he be everything we never were? Can he be everything we never were? Can he actually love God with all his heart and soul and strength? He's been announced. He's been revealed. It, Testing time's about to come. And notice who comes on the scene. I've always thought that we should just handle the translation around the devil well. He seems to hang around S-verbs. He slinks and he slithers, doesn't he? That's what he does at this point. He slithers onto the scene. And he tempts Jesus. I'm at point two on the outline. The temptations are familiar, aren't they? We know these temptations. We've read this story. The first temptation is obvious, it's the one of hunger and the devil offers him a scenario, turn these stones into bread and Jesus resists, doesn't he? He quotes from the Old Testament and he stands up and responds to the devil appropriately. The second temptation is a little more obscure, it takes him to a high place. I, I don't think it's a vision, I actually think it's in reality and he encourages him to prove that his dad loves him. Throw yourself off, daddy will look after you. And again, Jesus resists, doesn't he? And he quotes from the Bible, from the Old Testament. Oh, the final temptation is pretty clear. Those two have failed, but gold will work, won't it? And so I'll offer you all the kingdoms of the universe. Here's your shortcut to power and fame. And again, Jesus resists and quotes from the Bible, from the Old Testament. Now, on one level, I'm so thankful he resisted. Do you notice that the problem with all the superheroes we have in the movies at the moment is they have no self-control? That's why the stories are made. That's why there's drama, because they, they've got no self-control. I want a superhero with self-control. That's what Jesus has shown here, isn't it? 
If there's someone going to beat up on the devil, he needs to be self-controlled. That's not really what's going on, is it? It's not about whether Jesus is self-controlled. You see, I think we've got to actually ask ourselves, why are these temptations? Why are they tests? Why these particular three? What is tempting about these offers? I think the first way to answer it, let's quickly go back through them. And the first way to answer it is to actually notice how the devil addresses him. Did you see it in verse 3? Did you see it there in verse 6? Uh, it's implied in verse 9. How does the devil address him? If you are the son of God. Hasn't that just been revealed at the baptism? This is my boy, the king. I don't think the devil doubts that Jesus is the son of God. There's no notion of doubt here. Je God has announced it. The genealogy has proven it. But imagine if you're a son of God another way. Imagine if the devil can tempt Jesus to be a son of God in a way that doesn't delight God. Wouldn't that be a success? Wouldn't that scupper all the plans for dealing with sin? Isn't that the way the devil's always operated? Uh, there's a man and a woman made in the image of God. And the devil says, well, you can be in the image of God another way. And what happens? Uh, there's a king who's described as the son of God, not going out in springtime and avoiding his responsibilities. Hey, mate, uh, you could be a king who's the son of God another way, couldn't you? Isn't that the way the devil's always worked? You can be part of God's family, perhaps another way. That's a temptation, isn't it? <laughs> to express being God's son wrongly. That's what he wants to get at. And he provides the opportunity. I think the second clue we need to notice is how Jesus responds. Now, we know he responds from the Bible, don't we? I mean, we've heard sermons on this that say, memorise your Bible. You'll always stand up against the devil. We know that he quotes from the Bible. He quotes from the Old Testament. We know he quotes from a particular book, don't we? The book of Deuteronomy. And we know that each quote comes from a particular three chapters, Deuteronomy 6, 7 and 8. Deuteronomy is a marvellous book. Drinda's right. Uh, it's three sermons by Moses to God's people after they've wandered for 40 years and been hungry, where God has actually said to them, I'm unique, trust me with your heart, soul and strength. And as they go into this little patch of geography on the edge of the Mediterranean, Moses preaches three sermons and says, remember who God is. Give him your heart, soul and strength. So when Jesus responds to the devil by quoting from those three chapters, he's making a pretty obvious connection, isn't he? I'm not going to be like them. I am not like them. I am everything they should have been but couldn't be. And when you dig down a little deeper, you'll see that each of the temptations touches on the heart, the soul and the strength. But that first temptation, it's linked to food. I can be tempted by any amount of food, let me tell you. But the temptation isn't eat food, is it? Listen to how Jesus responds. He quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you'd keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the word, from the mouth of God. See, the temptation isn't Jesus' intestines, is it? God tested his people in the wilderness with hunger to see where their hearts lay. How'd they go with that? Gee, those Jews were better in Egypt. How did Jesus go with that? I trust you, God, to give me what I need. 
where his heart is solid. It doesn't stray, even tested by hunger. The second temptation is to do with his safety, isn't it? And as Jesus responds to the devil standing up there on that top of that highest place in all of Jerusalem, he speaks to the devil from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massa. What happened in Massa? Well, they were thirsty. They had no water. They were dry in the desert and they complained to God. They said, God, you don't have our safety at heart. And what did God do? He delivered them bountiful water they could drink. You see, they doubted whether God had their souls at heart and so their souls wandered, didn't they? They didn't do real well there, did they? How did Jesus go? Does his soul wander? Does he find his safety anywhere else but in God? Oh, the third temptation, well, that's linked to power, isn't it? Uh, That's linked to taking matters into your own hands, to exerting your own strength, even if it is to bow a knee to the wrong one. That's picking up on the issue of where is your strength and how does Jesus respond to Deuteronomy 6 verse 12. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only and take your oaths in his name. God has just wiped out the Egyptian army. He's destroyed the Egyptian gods. He's displayed his power in creation. And they get to the edge of the Red Sea and go, God, what? where's our strength? How did God's people do with that? Not real well, did they? And yet offered the temptation to bow a knee. Jesus relies on whose strength? God's strength. Did we catch all that? There's a lot there, isn't there? The devil knows that Jesus is God's son. He doesn't doubt that. He just wants to offer him an alternative way of expressing it. He targets the heart of Jesus, the soul of Jesus, the strength of Jesus. It's always worked, hasn't it? (laughs) Why not try it again? And what does Jesus do? Well, he resists. He shows that his heart, he shows that his soul, and he shows that his strength is devoted to whom? To God. Because he knows that God is worth trusting. He knows that God will care for his soul. And he knows that it is God's strength alone that grants the success. Jesus has been tested, hasn't he? He's been tempted, and let me tell you, he's everything he claims to be. He's been announced, he's been revealed, he's been tested. He's made of the right stuff. We hoped he would be, we thought he might be, we joined the dots, and he is. And so Jesus then does something that no other person has ever done. In verse 10, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, and then the devil left him. When's that happened before in the Bible? When's that happened before in history? Where a human being born on earth looks the devil in the eye and says, rack off, and the devil does. He's been tested. He's been tried. And he's not been found wanting. Perhaps... Perhaps he can actually do it all. Perhaps he can forgive my sin. Perhaps he can rule in a way that is just and loving and fair. Perhaps he can save the world. As a Blues supporter, I'm thankful for Brad Fiddler. Let me tell you. Mad as a cut snake, but gee, he did the job. Announced, revealed, tested. Came through with the goods. I'm more thankful for Jesus. He looked the devil in the eye. His heart, his soul and his strength were undivided, devoted and he told the devil to go away and the devil did. The consequences are a little larger, aren't they? (laughs) 
So what am I going to do with that? What am I going to do with that? Now, this sermon's been applied or passage has been applied in many ways over history, hasn't it? Uh, all good ways. Memorise the Bible. Resist the devil. If you are hungry, trust in Jesus. Uh, don't hear me wrongly. I, I think they're good applications. I just don't think that's what Matthew is aiming for. Matthew's aiming for something much bigger, isn't he? Remember why Matthew writes? Hey, people, the one who can deal with your broken world, he's here. The one whom God promised is here. The one who can do everything that people have failed to do is here. Put simply, Jesus can do the job given to him. Jesus can do the job given to him. He will succeed where every other person has failed. Now, that's a major break in history, isn't it? <laughs> Brad Fittler broke that cycle. But let me tell you, when we lose in 2020, he'll be sacked and we'll find someone else. Don't ever do that with Jesus. There is no other such significant break in the history of the world, is there? Where a man looked the devil in the eye and his heart, his soul and his strength didn't waver and he said to the devil, go away, and the devil did. So let me close with this encouragement and warning. Let me encourage you to see Jesus as he truly is. He is everything that we are not. He does everything we cannot do. He has been announced, revealed and tested and no other man or woman can tell the devil to go away. He is whom we hope him to be. But let me warn you, don't ever sack him. Don't ever replace him. Don't ever find a substitute because no one else can beat sin the way he does. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for Matthew, a tax collector who became a disciple of Jesus who wrote this down for us. Thank you for your son, announced, revealed, tested and everything that we need him to be. Father, this is a great encouragement. Please enable us to find all of our confidence in the heart, soul and strength of Jesus that never wavered. And please help us never to substitute him. Amen.